Well, here's a story that connects greatly with what our topic is today. In 1945, a young musician and his fiancée had scraped enough money together to have a simple wedding and then to buy two train tickets to a city that had a re hotel, a resort hotel. Well, when they got there, they found out that, uh, found out that the uh, hotel had closed. And so they were kind of, here they are, they're stranded in this city. That they, they don't know anybody. They don't have a lot of money. And so they begin to thumb a ride. Well, uh, a sympathetic driver took them to a grocery store owned by a woman that he knew. Uh, the first night, they spent the night above the grocery store. But the next day, the, the, the lady who owned the grocery store began to hear this young musician playing his trombone, and he was playing Christian music. And so she connected them to a, another couple, a Christian couple, that allowed them to stay the rest of their uh, honeymoon in their home. Well, after several days, the uh, host invited this couple to, a young, to an evangelistic meeting led by young evangelists. When he, they got there, they found out that the person who was supposed to lead the music had become sick. And so they asked him, to uh, this young musician, uh, to lead the music. Uh, they said there would be a young evangelist speaking at this, this uh, youth rally. Well, guess who that young evangelist was? Billy Graham. And guess who that young musician was? That was there as well. Cliff Barrels. Cliff Barrels was uh, the music director for Billy Graham for over 60 years. And that began a partnership of the two uh, that lasted a lifetime. Billy Graham said this of Cliff. Cliff and I were together more than 60 years, and in all that time, we never had an argument. <laughs> that interesting. Folks, that was providential. That was God's providential, sovereign hand. And I suspect Cliff, in the beginning, probably thought, man, what a flop of a, of a honeymoon. I mean, I've, I've messed up this honeymoon, and my wife, my bride, has to be disappointed with me. But the, what he didn't realize is that what he thought was a flop was God's providential hand in his life. That changed his life in their life. Well, there's no greater passage in the Bible that underscores not only the providence of God, but also the sovereignty of God than Romans chapter 8, verse 28. For the Christian, it is arguably the most glorious of all promises in the Scripture. John MacArthur said of this passage, it is breathtaking in its magnitude, encompassing everything that pertains to a believer's life. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was an ex excellent expositor, uh, he said this of this passage. He says, do you know that God is overruling everything in the whole cosmos for your good? He says, you cannot know it and be depressed at the same time, for such knowledge and depression are mutually exclusive. Wow. It speaks volumes of encouragement to believers. And so many believers have kind of hung on to that promise. And yet, it is arguably the most misquoted, the most misunderstood passage in all of the New Testament, at least. And I think because it has been quoted so often out of context, it has lost its power and it has lost its authority. Well, today we're going to give it this passage, it's proper historical and grammatical interpretation because we're going to interpret it within the historical and grammatical, what? Say it with me. Context, right? And equally as important, too, what we will do today, I believe the text does this, I, I don't do it, it will answer the question, what do I need to know about God's providence in facing the storms of life? So grab your Bible or your electronic device and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And as you turn there, you'll note that 
Last week we looked at two verses, verses 26 and 27, which we saw speaks of the Holy Spirit being an advocate with us during our time of prayer. When we reach those moments when we don't know what to pray, when we're agonizing, perhaps suffering, this passage says that we have the Holy Spirit who is an advocate an advocate's someone who comes and certainly pleads our case, but it's also someone who speaks to us. An attorney would take someone aside and say, here's what you need to say when you're placed on the stand. So it's an advocate in, in two ways. But as you progress to verse 28, you'll note that it begins with the conjunction, the conjunction and. Now what does that tell us? Any Bible student, when you're going through a passage, you see that, you want to say, okay, and what is he doing? What, why is that transition there? And in this particular case, it is a, it's a continuation of a thought. So he's adding to a thought that he's already given in this passage. Essentially, he tells us that, that, look, God the Holy Spirit is not only our help in terms of when we have to pray, especially during adverse circumstances. But he's also, he watches over our lives and he superintends our lives and he overrules in our lives so that his purposes will be accomplished. Now, the next key we see in that verse is the phrase, we know. Now, the first thing we want to know about that we know, and by the way, it's one Greek word, but it's a, and, and know is a verb. So the first thing we want to know is that this is a present Greek present tense. The New Testament was written in Greek, and so it's a Greek present tense. Now, what does that mean? The present tense speaks of continuous action, habitual action, or in this particular case, continuous abiding knowledge. Now, it's important for us, I think, to know that in the Greek, there are three different words that are translated no in the English. Uh, translated as no in the English. Uh, first, there's, go ahead and put up the first one. First, there's gnosko or gnosis, which is a beginning knowledge or beginner's knowledge. Someone who has just begun to understand something. The next one is Epinosis. Epi is a prefix put on the, this word basically. And epi it means on top of or above. And so you put it here together. It means knowledge on top of knowledge. And this places the emphasis upon, this knowledge does, it places the emphasis upon participation in that knowledge. We would call it experiential knowledge. So what does that look like? Here's what it looks like. Let's say you memorize a verse. Gnosis. You just be, you've memorized this verse but you haven't experienced the truth of that verse in life. And all of a sudden, God takes you through some type of experience, and boom, that verse pops up in, the, in your mind. And it said, and you realize, whoa, now I know what God was talking about through this word, through this passage, through this promise. And so that becomes experiential knowledge. But the highest kind of knowledge is the third one. Oida, this is full and complete, absolute Knowledge. This is experiential knowledge, but it's knowledge on top of knowledge. It is complete knowledge. And that is the ver word that's used here. So whatever this passage means, the Apostle Paul says, we have a continuing, habitual, absolute knowledge about this passage. Now, the idea that's intimated here is that we have a complete knowledge. Now watch this that you can rest in, in which you can rest. When it becomes absolute, when you, take a, when you, when you go into a, take an exam and you've studied everything there is to know and you know, you know this stuff, and you say, I've got that, that's that kind of absolute, complete knowledge. And that's what Paul is saying here. When um, he's saying you can rest in this. I, I've shared with you before that uh, my first year in college, uh, my, the summer, I needed to take a, an elective, so I, I, took a one, I took two classes, but one I took was a swimming class. Now, I've told you that 
Uh, I could swim when I came out of high school, but I was not a great swimmer. My brothers were great swimmers, and I always wanted to be as good as they were. But uh, I, I was not. I was kind of fearful of the water, quite frankly. But I thought, here's, a, here's an elective swimming class. I'll take it. And so in that class, I learned every stroke, every style that you could have. Backstroke, you know, side stroke, frog stroke, whatever it was, all kinds of you know, styles of, of swimming. And as I learned about how to do it and, and got into the water and began to experience and be able, I learned to just relax. Now I, my favorite style of swimming is on my back. And so you, you just relax. Well, that's the idea. You learn stuff, but then it becomes an experiential truth, and you begin to rest. And that's what Paul is trying to say here. You rest. He puts it in the form, in fact, of an assumption. And he says, I'm telling you all because you know this. Now, he's assuming that they know. Now, he could have said that. <laughs> he could have said that in order to say, you should know this. Uh, sometimes our parents may say, or we say this to parents, we, uh, to our kids, you know this, or you should know this, right? That's the idea here. Um, but we know today that's not always true, about, especially when it comes to this passage. There are so many believers who, who do not comprehend com completely what this verse is saying. So basically, we won't allow this verse to speak for itself and let it tell us again what we need to know about God's divine providence in facing the storms of our lives. And in doing so, we will deal with, some, again, some of the misconceptions. So let's break down this passage. And the first thing you see after you see we know, you see things work together for the good. We're just going to look at that phrase, together. Synergao. It's a word from which we get the word synergism. Now what is synergism? Synergism is the working together of various elements to produce an effect greater than and often completely different from the sum of each element acting separately. In the physical world, the right combination of otherwise harmful chemicals can produce something of good, of good value, of great value. For example, salt, right? <laughs> Salt's made up of two poisons, sodium and chlorine, right? So, well, that, but it works together. And that's a great picture of what God, what God does in our lives. He takes you know, the, that which is maybe bad, but he moves it. when he gets a hold of it, he brings it out for the good. Now, this verse has been a blessing to many people over the years. We know that. But many times when people quote this verse, they quote it this way. All things work together for good to them who love God. Now, anything wrong with that? That's a, that's a King James translation, right? Anything wrong with that? My translation says, what? God causes all things to work together. So, what is there a problem here? Let me just say this. I think that sometimes people who just quote the verse this way from the King James, all things work together for the good to those who love God. I think it has led people to think that everything is going to work out in the end. Everything's going to work out in a wash. Everything's going to be, everything's going to be fine. How many times have I heard people say, it was all meant to be, or all things happen for a reason. Now, Sometimes when I hear people say that, it just drives me up the wall. It's like, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard. And the reason why is because some of those people who say those things, I have known and known clearly that they were not either believers or they were not, as a believer, walking with God. So let's ask the question and answer the question, why is there a discrepancy here between these two translations? And the King James was translated in, anybody know? 1611. 
at that time, when it was translated, it was translated from about a half dozen, at least the New Testament we're talking about. It was translated from about a half dozen Greek manuscripts. Since that time, we now have over 5,000 Greek manuscripts. Big difference. And so those who have, as time went on, as there are more manuscripts came to bear, other manuscripts, not all of them, but other manuscripts would add theos before all things work together. God, it would say, God causes all things work to work together. And so, the, you know, the, again, we know that it is God who works all things together for the good. So here's your first point. And when I, well, let me just go ahead and read it. I need to comprehend, that is, I need to have full confidence. I need to comprehend who directs all things. Ultimately, the variations in translations do not make the slightest difference. I mean, in fact, we've seen in recent weeks that God causes creation and directs creation and watches over creation. And we know that when Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation, that he's going to usher in the millennium. He's going to bring back his believers, those who have trusted Christ in the church age. The Old Testament saints will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation. And there, he's going to usher in a new millennium. And then after that, at the end of the millennium, after a thousand year reign, Christ, this earth is going to burn up, and this earth is going to be resurrected into a new heaven and a new earth, and there's going to be a new Jerusalem. So we know that it's God who directs all things, starting with this creation, this universe. Uh, listen, the universe does not work automatically. It is still ultimately under God's control. Job said it this way in chapter 26. He wraps up the waters in his clouds and he, obs he obscures the face of the full moon and spreads his cloud over it. What does that tell you? It tells, it tells you that God is even in charge of the atmosphere. Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 says, For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and what? For him. He is before all things, and don't miss this, in him all things hold together. It's, folks, it's God who holds this universe together. Nobody else. Nobody else. I talked about that a few weeks ago. Someone said it this way. I liked this. Providence is the hand of God in the glove of history. Providence is the hand of God in the glove of history. It's a great statement. Here's the point. This promise in Romans 8.28 is empty unless we understand that God is sovereign. You say, what does sovereign mean? What does it, sovereign, God's sovereignty mean? Here's what it means. It means that God exercises his prerogative to do whatever he pleases with his creation. That's what it means. Write down Psalm 24, 1. Don't miss that. It says, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Let me illustrate it this way. Let's say somebody comes over to my house and they say, um, a friend of mine perhaps, and they come over to my house and they say, you know, Morgan, I don't like your furniture. In fact, I don't even like the, your pictures on the wall. I, I think you should get rid of those and get some more. In fact, I don't even like the way you have your bedroom arranged. I, now, you know what my response is going to be? It's probably the same as yours. I'm going to say, as long as I'm paying for this stuff, I'm the one who gets to make that decision. You don't get to make that decision. You want to pay for it? That's fine. I'll let you do that. Well, that's what God's sovereignty means. It means that he is the one who created this universe. He is the one who has the prerogative to do, now watch this, to do as he pleases. 
Listen to these verses. Job 23, verse 13. It says, but he is unique in who can turn him, that is God, in what his soul, God's soul, desires that he does. Job 42, 2. Says, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. You see, here's what it means for the believer. His sovereignty means that there's no such thing as chance. There's no such thing as luck. There's no such thing as mistakes. Now, how do we translate that into our lives? It means I must have and need to have complete confidence in God's control over all things. If I don't have a proper view of God, and namely of his sovereignty, then this verse will, will solely depend upon how I feel about who God is. So you have to understand this. If you're an unbeliever, things don't just work out for reason. There's no such thing as that. Now, the next thing you have to measure in this passage is that it states God causes all things to work together for the bad. Is that what it says? No, it says for the good, right? So, what is that good? So many people think that the good here is that God is going to make everything ultimately in our lives to turn out for our happiness and our contentment. Isn't that, isn't that kind of what people think? I mean, girl gets dumped by her boyfriend. Her friends run up to her and says, Romans 8.28, Romans 8.28, Romans 8.28. All things work together for the good. Now, what does that mean in the minds of those people, those friends? That means that God's got, uh, got a hunkier guy for you. He's got a better looking guy for you, right? And we laugh but I don't know how many times I've heard that. Um, you, you, you lose your job, you're fired, you're terminated. People run up to you, say, oh, an old sage runs up to you and says, hey, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28. Now what does that mean in the thinking of that person? In their thinking, they're saying, God's got a better job for you. He's got, in fact, this job's gonna pay a lot more money and it, with greater benefits than the one you just had. <laughs> now, does God do that sometimes? Absolutely, he does. I can tell you of many experiences in my life and in many others' lives. But is that what this passage is saying? Absolutely not. Your house got foreclosed? Don't worry about it. Romans 8, 28. God's got a... The next house is going to be bigger and better than the, the previous. Forget about the other one. But that's not what this passage is saying. And listen, these preachers who keep building people up and making them think, who preach this kind of prosperity doctrine, are setting believers up for a big fall because they become disillusioned that God hasn't come through to answer their prayer. And so they fall. So here's the next point. I need to comprehend what good means. I need to comprehend what good means. He is going, listen, here's the point. He, and we're going to get more into this next week. He's going to cause things to work out for his purposes in our lives. And his purposes, at least in the beginning, are not always satisfying. Look at verse 29, and we're just going to touch on part of this because we're getting into this next week. He says, for those whom he foreknew. Foreknew what? Now, what? Now, now keep in mind, the word for, I should go back to that preposition. For really is introducing, he's saying, because of this, because of this. All things are working together because why? Why? Because we know that God, who knows, who knew who would come to him, he also predetermined to become, to become conformed to the image of his son. That's God's purpose in our lives. That's what he's talking about in this passage. Some would say, well, wait a minute. How can he take all things and make them 
turn around and make them good. Well, think about this. The first effect of a trial, of a difficulty, is that we are shocked and we are awakened to think, what's going on here? What do I need to do to get this thing fixed, whatever it might be? See, we're now ready to pay attention to whatever the problem is and whatever we need to do. You see, the most dangerous condition for all of us is when everything is going smoothly, without much change and without much of a challenge. That's when we're in a dangerous place. Trials in themselves often serve a good purpose to get our eyes back where they need to be on the Lord and his purpose in our lives. You see, Satan loves for us to have this false confidence that everything is fine. It's similar to the guy that's, his health is deteriorating, and he's, but he just keeps on working. Things are going well at work. Things are going fine. And all of a sudden, he has this severe pain. And what happens? Well, he goes to see the doctor, where the doctor surveys the scene, examines him, and determines this guy's got some problems. And he says to him, why didn't you come to see me before now? Of course, you know the answer to that is that he's not going to do that until there was pain in his life. Well, God sometimes has to do that with us. Otherwise, we keep trucking on down the road. Now, from the human viewpoint, not all circumstances are good. But it's often through the trials and the storms of life that God causes us to look to the lighthouse of his word and to hear exactly what God is saying. We, last week we talked about Paul. Remember Paul, he had an affirmity, affliction, and he called upon God to remove it. Now, what was that? Well, most scholars believe that it had to do with his eye. There was a, he had some type of eye disease. In fact, there are some scholars who even say that his eye was, was grotesque. Now, you think about that. That would give you, good, if you were Paul, that would give you good reason to, to say, you know, it makes good sense to me for God to remove this, whatever this is, because I'm running, people are looking at me and running the other way. Here's just a thought I had. It could be that God allowed it, if this is true, it could be that God allowed that so that people wouldn't be attracted to his charisma as much as they were to the word of God. But did God remove it when Paul called on him to remove it? Did God remove it? No, no. That certainly wouldn't fit the uh, the. the, the the genre of, of the, what, the message that so many of these preachers are preaching today. Everything's going to be great. No. Paul realized that when he is weak, the weaker he is, the more Paul becomes the conduit through which the power of God is released, which is true with all of us. See, God often has to bring pain into our lives to accomplish that. Hmm. Think of the young boy. Uh, Debbie and I have known couples, young couples in the various churches that we've pastored, that I've pastored. Um, young boy, he's just started walking, and the doctor says his feet are not correct, they're not pointed in the right direction. And so what they have to do, they had to do, is they have, to, they have this little brace they put on their legs and at the bottom of their brace between their feet, there's this bar that holds it. And so when they go to bed, they put this on them and they have to sleep with their feet pointed with that. And of course, you hear the parent, if you talk to the parent, you hear them say, man, it's horrible to hear him crying through the night, and you want to go in there and just take them off and say, don't. But we know that's for his good. And one said to us, when he looks at us, when we're putting it on, he looks at us like, why are you doing that to me? 
and yet God sometimes has to bring pain into our lives to get us to walk correctly in the Spirit. Does God use sometimes, does God bring some difficulty into our lives to cause us to get our focus right or to use us in his program? Sure he does. Think of Joseph. What happened to Joseph? When Joseph was, you know, thrown in, rejected by his brothers and then thrown in jail, and finally he ended up at next to Pharaoh in terms of authority. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, uh, in fact, I want to back up to verse 19. You want to write this down. And here's the, the context is that Joseph is facing his brothers. His brothers now have come to Egypt, uh, and, and they now realize who he is, and they are terrified. But Joseph said this, Do not be afraid, for I am in God's place. I'm in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Let me ask you, when the difficulty comes, when the pain comes, the emotional pain and other things, when you feel that God's not leading you the right way, you feel like things are not falling, how do you process that? Can I, then, can I now look at Romans 8, 28 and say, I know that God is leading, he is sovereign, he is over all, and thus, though this is painful, it is good for me. At this point, we read back in Romans 8, 28, it says, and we know that all things, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. So, what does this mean? Those who love God. We would say, you would think he's talking about Christians, right? And so, why not just say, Paul, why not just say those who are believing in Christ, those who have trusted Christ, however you want to say it. He doesn't say that. He says, those who love God. Here's point three. I need to comprehend who are those who love God. Who are those who love God? Now, when Christians see this today, they think very much in the subjective. They think, well, I I think I love God. Yeah, I I love God. I I feel like I love God. I I do. (laughs) Today, I, I want us to clarify exactly what this means because I think this is the biggest challenge of being a pastor in the 21st century uh, in, in, in any western culture especially America perhaps the worst I can ask the question to some Christians and they'll say I can say do you love God and they'll say mm. they'll begin to evaluate the word love well I I, I don't know I I I, I, yeah, I think I do. Oh, yeah, I do. I, I love God. <laughs> well, let's ponder that just for a moment. Hmm. And let's think of examining the direct object of that sentence. Do you love God? God being the direct object. Now, what I mean by this is the real God, not the God with the lowercase g. What I mean by that is the God of your imagination or the God of our feelings. Because in the 21st century Western culture, Western Christianity, here's the problem. We all go around in our culture generally as people that unfortunately avoid this book. We don't know this book like we used to know this book, especially as a believer. My problem, and and I don't want to put down this culture, I don't want to sound negative about this culture, but I am gravely concerned about the church and its illiteracy concerning the Word of God. 
my problem is if I don't love the God of this book, then I love the God of my imagination, the God of my feelings. And that God, the God of my imagination, is not the real God. I want you to hold your place and go to Psalm 50, Psalm 50. You'll want to note this passage and perhaps come back to it later. Um, but in Psalm 50, in verse 21, we, just, we don't have time to read this whole section, but we'll read verse 21. Um, it says, these things you have done and I kept silence. You thought that I was just like you. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. Now, did you get that? Here's what God was saying to them. You thought you, that I was like you. You believed wrongly. You thought wrongly. You did wrongly. And I didn't respond. I didn't send a lightning bolt to take care of you, to take, you know, get rid of you. But because of that, you projected your values, your ideas, your imaginations, your preferences on me. And he said, not so. And in the ensuing verses, it talks about God's judgment. This, this point about I love God, the ones who love God, is not some sliding scale. Well, I love God this much, but if God does this much for me. It's not a matter of sentiment. It's not a matter of feelings. But those who love God are objectively spelled out in Scripture. Some people think that they love God because they are in a worship service and they begin to experience these goosebumps. Now don't get me wrong, there's a place for emotions in worship. God says, worship me in spirit and in truth. There's a place for that, okay? But there are others who have this emotional, they go to a conference, they go, there's a lot of music, a lot of singing, a lot of worship, and they, you know, and, and they have this emotional experience, and so they think, that's love, that's loving God. And a lot of those people are the people who determine whether the spirit is in a worship service based upon uh, how they feel. <laughs> Aren't you glad that uh, God's presence is not dependent upon other people who feel or don't feel the Spirit of God. The Bible says when two or three are gathered in his name, who's there? Nobody? No, he said, I'm there. I'm there. Now, the Word of God is very objective. Here's, here's a verse for you. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by the Father, and I will love him, and will disclose myself to him. So what does love equal here? Feelings? Imagination? Obedience. Obedience. One thing I love about the Word of God is that there are so many checks and balances. It's like mathematics. I, I, I use this simple illustration. Go ahead, Diane, put that up. In elementary school, we learned that two from four equals what? Two. Now, how do we check that? Simple, right? Teacher always said, you go back and you check, add the two bottom numbers. They equal four. The Bible's like that. I'm amazed at so many Christians who, who, who live in, by feelings and so forth, and yet when tough times come, they're not obedient. God says this very, the word, the word of God says this very clear. Look, love is always practical. Love, to love God includes that I desire to please him, to glorify him, to become like him. And get this now, I'm willing to sacrifice it for him. Think of those people you love the most. Spouse, hopefully. Children you would probably say, if push came to shove, I would die for each of those people, right? A person who loves God is willing to be obedient to God even in the most difficult times. Think of Daniel. Remember Daniel? The decree came out and said, anybody who prays to that God, Yahweh, Jehovah, they're going to be thrown into the lion's den. What did Daniel do? He went back to his apartment 
with the windows open and begin to pray three days, three times the day like he always had. There's a guy who loved God. It wasn't talk. It was the real deal. Our love is tested and proven more through trials and tribulations than through what we may feel or think. Uh, particularly at a summer conference. I, growing up in the church, I, I was a leader in the church. Uh, I grew up in the church. I went to tons of, of uh, youth retreats in the summer. And then in high school, I was very involved in Youth for Christ. And we had retreats on weekends and so forth. And, you know, invariably, you go to these retreats, these conferences, and, man, they're wonderful. You, get, you have a lot of fun, but there's great music and services. You have great speaker. And by the end of the week, everybody has come down the aisle to make a decision for Christ, to recommit their lives to Christ or to trust Christ. But invariably, three months down the road, half of those people are floundering. Some of them have already fallen away. But they would tell you when they left that conference, they loved God. Why? It's kind of like the difference between Job's wife and Job. Remember, remember what Job's wife said? She said, when, when trouble came, she said, curse God and, and die, man. Are you still going to hold to your integrity? Are you really still going to hold to that? And what did he say? He says, you speak as a foolish woman. He says, should we accept only good from God and not bad? He says, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Whatever, here's how you translate this. Whatever pain he brings into my life, I will trust him to know what he's doing. So how, what do we need to know about God's providence to face the storms of life? Let's put them back up. First, I need to, go ahead, I need to comprehend, fully understand who directs all things. That's God. I need to comprehend what good means. And thirdly, I need to comprehend who are those who love God. You get those three. You get those, understand those. And, and, and here when we get to this about who directs, we're talking about the sovereignty of God. I believe that God is in charge, even in charge of my pain. You know, he oversees my pain. So what's the application of Romans 8.28? Here it is. Be sure be sure that you have a biblical love, a biblical love. Be sure that it's biblical, meaning you want to be obedient to him. Here's how I'm going to be, show you my love, God. I'm going to obey you, and I'm going to trust you, even with the pain in my life, the storms in my life. And then secondly, trust in God's management of all things. Trust in God's management of all things. If you're an unbeliever, things do not all work together for a reason. At least not because God is behind it. That God in his grace treats all of us with mercy. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I want to say to you that he loves you. And he wants so much to lead your life and to guide your life and give you the, the abundant life. He said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And if you're listening online and you've never trusted Christ, I want to encourage you to consider Christ. Write us. We'd be glad to respond to you and talk to you more about uh, knowing Christ as your Savior and, and what it means to live and have him guide your life. For believers... I know during this time, there are a lot of people who are suffering with some degree of discouragement or depression or whatever it might be. I mean, I know a lot of people, and that's understandable in light of what's going on here. God understands that. God is not austere or aloof, and he's not frowning. He's saying, come on, just let me, let me walk with you. I want to walk with you. And if you let me walk with you, and if you'll trust me, then you can have peace and joy in the midst of this very difficult time in your life.